Hey everyone, welcome back. I hope everyone is doing well. If you are new here, please consider subscribing if you end up liking this video. Today, we're gonna to be talking about a serial killer known as the Lake Elsinore Killer, also known as the Riverside Killer. There's a chance that you have never heard of this case before because this trial took place during the same time as the infamous OJ Simpson trial in 1995. I was pretty young when the OJ Simpson trial was going on, but I can still remember my family being absolutely obsessed with that case. That trial was pretty much the only thing on our TV at that time. And if it wasn't the trial itself, it was like trial commentary or news coverage of the case. It was literally the only thing anyone was talking about. And while the world was watching the OJ Simpson saga unfold, there was another lesser known but absolutely horrific case unfolding in the background. And that was the case of the Lake Elsinore killer. The Lake Elsinore killer was a man named William Suff, but pretty much everyone called him Bill. And Bill was really, really good at presenting himself is this very kind person just always willing to help out, just give you the shirt off of his back kind of person. But in reality, he was actually a monster. He's actually been referred to as the Jekyll and Hyde killer because his mild outward demeanor was in such stark contrast to the rage and the torture that he inflicted on his victims. And Bill Suff had actually already been convicted of a murder years before his serial killing even started. And if he wouldn't have been released well before he was supposed to be for that murder, then we wouldn't be talking about the Lake Elsinore killer today and at least 13 women would have never lost their lives. But you'll see as we get into this case how good Bill Suff was at presenting himself as this really good, upstanding member of the community. Bill had everyone in his community completely fooled. He was literally leading a double life and none of the women in the area were safe. He even led a local campaign for ride sharing as a way to help the environment. And there was even posters made of Bill standing in front of his van with the words, take a ride with Bill. And once you hear about the horrific things that Bill does in that van, you'll see just how creepy that is. And now let's just go ahead and jump into the case. But before we do, I would like to thank today's sponsor, Aura. Aura is a new all-in-one mindfulness and sleep app created with your well-being in mind. Aura has thousands of meditations, stories, soundscapes, and so much more to help transform your sleep and your stress levels to put you in a better mental space. And Aura's content is created by hundreds of expert coaches and therapists from all around the world world. I struggle with anxiety and occasional panic attacks. This is something that I've mentioned several times here on this channel. And one thing that I have found that really helps me is mental distractions. And lately I found that listening to stories is a really effective distraction for me. Aura offers hundreds of stories on their app and the narrator's voices are so soothing. It's a very relaxing experience. My favorite story so far is called American Mysteries from the Lights Out Library. It's a set of three stories told in one 52 minute segment. And one of the stories stories is about the Salem witch trials, which is something that's always fascinated me. I also love the soundscapes and the sleep music on the app. I love soft rain. It's so relaxing. It really helps to put my mind in a calm place before bed. And if you have anxiety issues, you know how difficult it can be to switch off your brain and stop worrying so you can fall asleep. There are thousands of positive reviews and over 7 million Aura users and Aura even won the best of Apple award. I highly recommend Aura. It's been instrumental in improving my my sleep and just feeling better throughout the day. And you can get started completely free on Aura's website when you use my link in the description box. And the first 500 people to use my link will get 25% off their first year subscription. Thanks again to Aura for sponsoring this video. And now let's jump back into the case. William Lester Suff was born on August 20th, 1950 in Torrance, California. And we don't really know too much about his childhood, to be honest, but we do know that he was the oldest of five children and his dad was an electrician and he would also sometimes play the drums in various Western bands around the area. And from what I can gather, his mother was a stay-at-home mom. She took care of the kids, took care of the house. Now, there is no evidence that Bill's parents were ever abusive towards the children, but his mom and dad were very volatile towards each other. They had a terrible relationship. They fought constantly and they did this in front of the children, which of course can be traumatizing, especially if this was a frequent thing. His mother's name was Elizabeth and she was said to be very, very controlling and domineering. She was also extremely overbearing and Bill was constantly fighting for his mother's approval. And Bill's father was just kind of there. He just kind of blended into the background. And Bill also did not get approval from his peers at school either. 
either. He was said to be a nice guy, but just kind of introverted, sort of stayed to himself. And he did have some friends, but he really wanted to be accepted by the popular crowd. And that just wasn't happening. Most people just really didn't notice Bill. And this likely added to his feelings of inadequacy. He just felt like he was never enough. And things got even worse for Bill when he was about 16 years old. And this is when his dad just up and left. I guess he just kind of hit a breaking point with Elizabeth and he just decided to pack up and he left and he abandoned his children. And this left Elizabeth all alone to take care of five kids all by herself. She was then forced to seek government assistance and she and the children went on welfare. And since Bill was the oldest, he was 16, he felt like it was up to him to help his mother take care of the other children. And that's exactly what he did. He he continued to go to school, but he got a part-time job to help out financially. And he would also help his mom just take care of his siblings in general. I read that his younger siblings would get into trouble quite often and Bill would have to step in to help to get them out of trouble. And so when I read that, I was like, oh, okay, they probably, you know, made bad grades or got into fights with schoolmates or something like that, you know, like typical kid stuff. But no, Bill's younger siblings would get into trouble for things like harming animals and starting fires. And I don't know any more than that. I don't even know if that's 100% fact because I only heard that from one source. But if that is true, then I really think that it's likely that there were worse things happening in the Suff household. Because you'll see later on in the case that Bill has a tendency to harm animals himself. And later when this case broke and Bill was interviewed, he was very tight lipped when it came to questions about his family. Okay, so now we are jumping ahead to Bill's senior year in high school. And at this point, Bill's mother, Elizabeth had remarried and the man that she remarried was basically the exact opposite of Bill's father. Bill's dad, like I said, was not very involved. He just kind of blended into the background. He did not discipline much, but the stepdad did. He was very, very strict, especially on Bill. Maybe because he was the oldest, I don't really know, but he was especially hard on Bill. But Bill found an escape in music. He joined the marching band in high school and he learned to play the trumpet and he really, really enjoyed this. He didn't really excel in school. He was considered average to like slightly below average as far as like his grades go, but he really excelled in band. And during his senior year, his high school marching band was selected to perform at the Rose Parade. And this was quite an honor. And it was at the Rose Parade that Bill met a girl who would go on to become his future wife, a 15 year old named Terrell. Terrell and her friend were at the Rose Parade and she and Bill just happened to meet and they exchanged phone numbers and that was that. And this was a big deal for Bill. He had never had a girlfriend before. He was always too shy or felt too insecure throughout high school. So he never had the courage to ask a girl for her phone number. And I think the fact that Terrell was only 15 and Bill was 18 definitely made it easier for him to find the confidence to ask her for her number. And so they started talking on the phone. They started exchanging letters to one another and they built up this little relationship. Then once Bill graduated from high school in 1968, he joined the Air Force and he moved to Fort Worth, Texas to start his training. But Terrell and Bill still continued to talk to each other pretty regularly. They talked as much as they possibly could. And one day Bill called Terrell and he asked her to marry him, but he did not get the response that he was hoping for. Terrell said that she couldn't marry Bill. In fact, they couldn't even continue their relationship because she had recently been raped and she just found out that she was pregnant. And she basically told Bill that she cared for him and you know she wanted to marry him, but you know now that she found out that she was pregnant, she really didn't think that he would wanna marry her anymore. And so she thought that they should just break the whole thing off. But Bill was like, no, it's okay. You know, I still really care about you. I still want to marry you. Let's just go ahead and get married and I will help you take care of the baby. And so Terrell agreed and the two of them got married. Now the plan was Terrell would stay back in California while Bill was in Texas so that she could give birth. And then once the baby was born, she and the baby would then make the move to Texas to live with Bill on base. However, after Terrell gave birth and started preparing to make plans, plans to move to Texas, Bill dropped a bomb on her. He told her that they couldn't keep the baby there with them on base because it was against the rules. And so he had told his superiors that the baby had died right after birth. And not only that, but Bill also had gone behind Terrell's back and arranged for the baby to go live with his mother and his stepdad. And Terrell was just really confused. Bill had told her that they were going to raise this baby together and she thought that they were going to live as like this little family. But now she's being told that she has to give up her 
her child. But at this point, they're married and she just feels like she has no choice. And so the baby was sent to live with Bill's mother and his stepdad. And as you can probably imagine, this marriage started to go downhill pretty much from the very beginning. As soon as Terrell moved to Texas, Bill started to show his true colors. He became physically abusive towards Terrell and he was extremely controlling and manipulative. He would not let Terrell out of his sight unless he absolutely had no choice. It was like she was now his property. She wasn't allowed to go grocery shopping without him. She couldn't go get her hair done without him. Pretty much anywhere that Terrell went, Bill was going to go with her. And he had such a short temper. He would be fine one minute and then he would just completely flip if Terrell did something that he didn't like. He would get so angry if he felt like he wasn't in total control and he would become violent. And then one night, Terrell witnessed something that really freaked her out. And just a warning, we are about to briefly mention animal abuse. So one night, Terrell and Bill were just sitting around their house and they had a kitten and this kitten would not stop meowing. And this started to really piss Bill off. He kept yelling at the kitten to shut up, but of course it didn't shut up because it was literally just being a kitten and it continued to meow. And Bill had finally had enough of this kitten not listening to him. Remember, he has to be in control. So he gets up and grabs his BB gun and he shoots and kills the kitten. Terrell has said that when she saw him do that, it really, really scared her as if she already wasn't scared enough. That just really freaked her out. And remember, Terrell is really young at this point and now she's in a totally different state, completely isolated from her friends and family. And she thought that she was marrying this sweet, mild-mannered, slightly awkward guy, but now she's finding out that he's nothing like the person she thought he was. And unfortunately, things just get worse from here. Not long after Terrell moved to Texas, she found out that she was pregnant. And I think that she probably thought having this baby would make them feel more like a family. Bill seemed to be excited about the idea of becoming a father. So Terrell was hopeful that things would get better and maybe having a child would calm Bill down some. But as you probably guessed, that did not happen. And just a warning, we are about to talk about some pretty severe child abuse. So Terrell gave birth to a baby boy that they named William Jr. in 1971. And in the beginning, Bill seemed really happy and he looked like a really proud dad. But once he realized that he was no longer the only person in Terrell's life that needed attention, he started to lash out at both Terrell and the baby. Bill would hit his newborn baby in the face if he wouldn't stop crying. He would yell at the baby and just be really violent towards him. And if Terrell ever tried to step in and stop Bill from abusing William Jr., he would then just turn his anger towards her. Bill just could not handle sharing Terrell's attention. He wanted her totally focused on him at all times. And when that didn't happen, because babies need lots of attention, he just became enraged. And not long after William Jr. was born, Terrell found out that she was pregnant again. And just 19 months after the birth of William Jr., they had a daughter that they named Dijanae, but they called her Didi. And the pattern of abuse just continued. Bill was just as abusive towards Didi as he was William Jr. When Didi would cry, Bill would get really angry and he'd yell at her to stop, which does not work on babies. That just makes them cry even more. So then he would become violent. And this abuse of the children started from pretty much day one. Now, during the time that William Jr. was born, Bill was discharged from the Air Force. Terrell has later said that she never knew why he was discharged. She didn't even know if it was a dishonorable discharge or not. She said he was just in one day and then the next he was out. After he was discharged, they did decide to remain in Texas and Bill just got random jobs in the area, but he was constantly getting fired for various reasons. One of the jobs that he had right around the time that Dee Dee was born was working as a parking attendant in a parking garage, but that job didn't last very long because Bill was caught trying to drive away with someone's car. So he was fired. So to help make ends meet, Terrell got a job working in a restaurant pretty much right after Dee Dee was born. And since Bill was unemployed, he would stay home to take care of the kids, which was the worst possible situation. We know how violent Bill is towards his children and the abuse just escalated with Terrell gone during the day. On the morning of September 25th, 1973, Terrell was up and ready for the day. She got up around seven to feed Dee Dee and change her diaper and then she laid her back down in the crib. She finished getting ready for work and then around eight o'clock, she woke Bill up to let him know that she was leaving. Her next door neighbor was a woman named Irene Taylor and Irene would take Terrell to work since they didn't have a car at the time. So Terrell and Irene leave for work, which meant that Bill was now home alone with his 21 month old son and his two month old daughter. And then later that day, Terrell received a phone call at work and it was Bill. He says that he needs her to come home immediately 
because something bad has happened to Dee Dee and she's not breathing. So Terrell immediately rushed home and she found her daughter unresponsive and Terrell is just in a panic and she asks Bill if he's called 911 and he says no, he hasn't. So she runs next door to Irene's house to use her phone to call 911 because she and Bill didn't even have a working phone at the time. But once paramedics arrived on the scene, Dee Dee was pronounced dead. And the autopsy confirmed that Dee Dee had suffered a long pattern of abuse. She had been hit in the abdomen so hard hard that her liver ruptured, causing massive internal bleeding, which ultimately led to her death. However, the pathologist also found evidence of previous serious injuries that were in the process of healing. Dee Dee had 13 broken ribs and a broken arm, all in the process of healing. She also had cigarette burns on her body, also in the process of healing. And this was proof that Dee Dee had been severely and repeatedly abused over the course of her short two month long life. This was not an isolated event. Whoever did this to Dee Dee had been abusing her for months and they had just finally gone too far. William Jr. was also examined and there was visible proof that he had also been severely abused. So police obviously have a lot of questions. They knew that Bill was the one who was watching Dee Dee and William Jr. that morning while Terrell was at work and they pretty much knew that he was to blame for this. But when they question Bill, he tells them that it wasn't his fault. It was actually his 21 month old son, William Jr. who had killed Dee Dee. Bill said that William had just been been hugging her too aggressively and he was the one that had caused her broken bones and her ruptured liver. And of course the police knew that this was a total lie and Bill was arrested and charged with the murder of his daughter. But then police turned their focus to Terrell because how much did she know? Had she been an accomplice? Had she also abused the children in the past? Irene Taylor, the next door neighbor, told police that Terrell had not been acting like her normal self that morning when she had picked her up for work. She said that typically when she would arrive to take Terrell to work, she would invite her inside for a bit and you know, they would come in and talk for a minute before they would leave. But this morning she just barely cracked the door open and Irene noticed that Terrell looked really pale and she just didn't look like herself. Then on the way to work, when Terrell would normally be just really talkative and upbeat, she was extremely quiet and she barely said a word. The prosecutors felt that they had enough evidence to also charge Terrell with the murder and she was also arrested. Bill and Terrell both pled not guilty and they went on trial together and their own lawyer would later say that they showed no emotion whatsoever during the trial. No emotion when they were being shown photos of their daughter's injuries. No emotion when every wound on their daughter's body was being discussed in great detail. The two of them would just talk to each other like they weren't actually on trial for murdering their infant. They would say things like, oh, how did you sleep last night? Oh, I slept like a baby. Things like that. So cold and unfeeling, which I understand coming from Bill, especially after you hear what he goes on to do, he was obviously a psychopath, but why was Terrell behaving this way? Maybe she was still under Bill's control or maybe she had just mentally detached herself from the situation as a way to cope. I don't know, but I do find it very bizarre. And Bill's lie about William Jr. causing the injuries and killing Dijonet, yet Terrell was claiming the same thing. Years after this in interviews, Terrell has said that she just didn't wanna believe that Bill would murder their daughter. So she let herself believe that her son had done this. But the jury was not buying any of their story and in the end they were both found guilty and they were both sentenced to 70 years in prison. And that is where this story should have ended but unfortunately we have so much more to talk about. So Terrell started filing appeals on the grounds that there was no evidence linking her to the abuse of her children or the murder of Dee Dee. And close to two years into her 70 year sentence she was granted a new trial. And this time the jury did agree that the evidence that they had against her was just circumstantial and there was no solid evidence proving that she had ever hurt her children and so she was released. And once she was out, she immediately filed for divorce from Bill and she tried to put her life back together. Now, Bill had no hope of getting a new trial and he knew this, so instead he tried a different tactic. He became a model prisoner. He took college courses, he volunteered for various jobs around the prison, he never got into any trouble, he literally became the epitome of of a model prisoner. And of course he did this with the hopes of being released early and that is exactly what happened. After serving only 10 years of his 70 year sentence for murdering his two month old daughter, Bill Suff 
was released from prison. And it's really such a shame that this happened because not long after his release, Bill Suff starts his life as a serial killer and at least 13 women would die because of him. So it is 1984 and Bill is now 34 years old and he's out of prison and he decides that Fort Worth is no longer where he wants to be. He really needs to go somewhere where people don't know about his murder conviction. So he decides to head back to California and he lives with his mother for a while near the Lake Elsinore area and he decides to reinvent himself and he gained the reputation for being a protector of the people in his community. He was always watching over the area to make sure things were okay. He got very involved in his community as well. Bill had successfully reinvented himself and no one seemed to be aware of his past in Texas so things were going pretty good for him. He even landed a pretty good job working for Riverside County at their supply warehouse as a stock clerk and everyone he worked with seemed to think really highly of him. His co-workers described him as almost almost too nice and helpful. He was always willing to help out. One coworker called him a really nice nerd. And even though he could come off a little bit awkward, people thought he was a really good guy. In April of 1984, Bill started dating a local Lake Elsinore woman named Bonnie Ashley and the two of them moved in together. Bonnie was living with her grandmother and she was taking care of her and she was also a substitute teacher. And so Bill moved in with Bonnie so that he could help her take care of her grandmother. And this lines up perfectly with that facade that he's got going on, that he's always there to help, appearing to be so caring and protective. But that wasn't the case at all because Bill was actually stealing from Bonnie's grandmother. Their relationship ended after nearly five years when Bonnie found out about the stolen money and she confronted Bill about it and he actually did admit to taking the money. So he moved out and he got a little apartment of his own, but not long after this, he got into a very serious motorcycle accident and he nearly died. He suffered a brain injury and and a broken leg and arm. And after the accident, he ended up moving back in with Bonnie so that she could help care for him while he recovered. And also because his new apartment was upstairs and he couldn't walk upstairs with a broken leg. So he moves back in with Bonnie temporarily while he recovers, but they were not back together at this point. She was just helping him out. And it would be during this time that Bill would begin visiting the red light district of Lake Elsinore and picking up sex workers. Now, the irony of this is that Bill had been speaking out to anyone who would listen about the sex workers in Lake Elsinore. He would always be talking about how much he hated the sex workers. And once he even told a group of people that he thought that they should all be killed. But this is where that whole double life thing really starts to take shape. Bill was pretending to be this really upstanding guy, always looking out for people. He would even patrol the apartment complex that he lived in, making sure that nothing sinister was going on, gaining people's trust and pretending to be so above the local sex workers. But in reality, he had been secretly visiting the red light district on a regular basis. Bill also seemed to be obsessed with law enforcement. He acted like he was a police officer. He even wore a jacket that sort of looked like a police jacket at first glance. He would patrol his apartment complex. Like I said, he would break up fights. He would report people who were parked illegally. He wanted to be seen as an authority figure around the area. And one aspect that he loved about his job at the Riverside County Supply Warehouse was that he frequently got to talk to the police officers when they would come in to get supplies. Bill would be the one to get the supplies for them and he'd always try to talk to them about various things going on in the city. And in January of 1989, for reasons we still don't fully understand, Bill began his life as a serial killer and he would target the sex workers in the Lake Elsinore and Riverside areas. One night in January of 1989, Bill went searching for sex on Main Street in Lake Elsinore. He pulled up next to a woman named Rhonda Jetmore. Rhonda was working the streets that night so she goes to the car window and she and Bill started talking. He tells her that his name is Bob and that he's interested in paying for her services. So they agree on $20 for just standard, basic, regular sex only. And then he asks Rhonda if she has a hotel room nearby that they could go to. And Rhonda says, no, I don't have a hotel room, but I do know of an abandoned house that's just like four blocks away and we can go there. Rhonda would frequently go to this house to sleep or to conduct business with her clients. So they head over to this abandoned house and they arrive and then they head inside. They went through the back door. Rhonda would always use the back door because the front door was locked and also so the neighbors couldn't see her going inside. So they go through the back door and now it's really dark outside at this point and this house is abandoned. So there's no electricity, which means that it's also very dark inside the house. But this was something that Rhonda was very much aware of. She comes to this house a lot. So she always carried a flashlight with her. So she and Bill walk inside of the house while Rhonda is using her flashlight to guide them in. She leads
leads Bill to one of the bedrooms where there is a bed and she sits down and she asks Bill for the money before they get started. So Bill opens his wallet and he hands Rhonda a $1 bill, not the $20 like they had agreed on. But before Rhonda could say anything to confront him about it, he lunged towards her and knocked her backwards on the bed and started strangling her. Now, Rhonda was frantically trying to fight him off, but she was starting to lose consciousness. But luckily she remembered that she had her flashlight with her. So she smashes Bill over the head with the flashlight, which stunned him long enough for her to get up and run away. Rhonda heads for the front door and she manages to make it to the living room, but Bill caught up with her and he tackled her to the ground and he just starts trying to pull off her clothes so that he could rape her. But Rhonda is still not giving up. She manages to get one of Bill's fingers in her mouth and she bites down as hard as she can. She actually bit him so hard that she broke one of her front teeth. Again, this distracts Bill long enough for her to get up on her feet and to run to the front door, but there were several locks on this front door and it was dark, so she was fumbling around and struggling to get them open. And once again, Bill grabs her and continues trying to rip her clothes off. But during all this chaos, Bill's glasses get knocked off and he can't see without them. So he just kind of stops and he says, okay, look, I won't hurt you if you just help me find my glasses. Just shine your flashlight around on the ground so I can find them and I will let you go. So. Rhonda starts shining her flashlight around the room until Bill spots his glasses. And when he leaned down to pick them up, she managed to get the front door open and she took off. She ran into the street and she flagged down a car and it just so happened that she knew the two guys in the car. So she starts telling them this crazy story about what had just happened and they see Bill running out of the abandoned house to his car. So the two guys start shooting at him. They fire like three or four shots at him, but Bill managed to get away. Rhonda did not report the incident to the police. She actually was so scared that she went to stay with her mother in another town. But just a couple of weeks later, she received a phone call from the Riverside County Sheriff's Department, but they were actually calling about an unrelated investigation. But while they were on the phone, Rhonda ended up telling the police everything that had happened. She gave them a pretty good description too. She said that the man was about 5'10", 180 pounds with reddish brown hair. He had sideburns, a mustache, he wore glasses, and he looked to be in his 30s. She also said that he told her his name was Bob, but she noticed that he was wearing a belt with a buckle with the name Bill etched on it. And during the attack, at one point, she had even called him Bill and he seemed to respond to that name. So she was pretty confident that his name was Bill. So they take down all of this information, but at this point, nothing's really being done. And just a few months after his attack on Rhonda, Bill got a cash payout for the motorcycle accident that he was in. And he used some of the money to buy himself a brand new silver Mitsubishi van with gray interior. And this van will become very important to this case. So it's now June of 1989. Bill has himself a brand new van to cruise around the red light district. And this is when the first of many bodies is discovered in the Lake Elsinore area. On June 28th, 1989, two men were working at a construction site in Lake Elsinore and they stumbled upon the body of 28 year old Kimberly Little lying face down in some bushes. She had obviously been murdered and she had been covered up with a blue towel and she was wearing a wet Western style shirt with dark colored socks, which they later determined had been put on her body after she was dead. Once police identified the body as Kimberly Little, they started talking to her friends and family and they learned that Kimberly was a sex worker and she typically worked the Main Street area of Lake Elsinore. She had made plans to have dinner with her daughter on June 26, but she never showed up. An autopsy revealed that Kimberly had been strangled to death. And like I said, the clothing had been put on her after she'd been murdered. And they discovered that some of the clothing wasn't even Kimberly's. The Western style shirt and the socks did not belong to her. And the way that Kimberly's body was covered up with a blue towel and also dressed made investigators believe that the killer must have felt at least some sort of remorse for what he'd done to her. Like he was trying to cover up what he'd done like he was ashamed. On December 12th, 1989, about six months after killing his first victim, Bill was back at it again. His next victim was a 23 year old woman named Tina Liel. Tina had last been seen by her brother on December 12th. The two of them had done drugs together that evening. Then afterwards, Tina and her brother were walking down the street and she suddenly just ran off. Tina was also a sex worker and she would work the red light district often. And unfortunately that night, Bill Suff just happened to pick her up and she'd never be seen alive again. The next day on December 13th, a couple was driving down an area that's usually deserted when they spotted the body of a woman laying in the road. The woman was of course Tina Liel and her body had been mutilated. This murder was so much 
much more gruesome than Bill's first. She had been strangled just like Kimberly Little, but she had also been stabbed in her chest and it was almost as if he was playing with her body. Her wrist had been taped and a three to four inch knife had been used to stab her heart four times. There were also cut marks on her right breast and a stab wound to her vagina all the way up to her pubic bone. And it was determined that this was all done while Tina was still alive. Then they found a 95 watt light bulb in her uterus. The killer had managed to insert the light bulb into her vagina through her cervix and into her uterus. And the light bulb was still intact. It did not break. And it's not known for sure if this was done before or after death. But to me, it seems likely that it was done after she was dead because the light bulb was still intact. And again, she had been dressed in clothes that didn't belong to her after she was murdered. Investigators managed to find some tire tracks and some shoe prints near the body. But at this point, nothing much was being done. It's been said by officers close to this case that since the victims were sex workers, their cases were not given much attention at first. And even though this murder did have some some similarities to Kimberly Little's murder six months earlier, no connection was made at this point. They were treated as two independent cases. Now, after the murder of Tina Leal, Bill really started to up the frequency of his murders. Just one month after Tina's murder, Bill was on the hunt again. Sometime in mid-January of 1990, Bill picked up a 23-year-old woman named Darla Ferguson while he was cruising the Lake Elsinore area looking for sex. She got into his van and she vanished. On January 18th, her body was discovered near Cottonwood Canyon Road in Riverside County. She was nude except for a trash bag that had been put over the upper part of her torso and then tied around her waist. She had been sexually assaulted and strangled. And throughout all of his murders that he commits, Bill just leaves his DNA everywhere. DNA testing started being utilized in cases in the late 80s. This was still a new concept to the general public and some people probably didn't fully understand what it would mean for criminals. Bill Suff seemed to not really understand the concept of DNA testing because he didn't even attempt to conceal his DNA. He was just leaving behind semen and saliva and hairs at all of the crime scenes. They also found shoe prints and tire tracks near the scene of this murder as well. This is now his third victim since starting his life as a serial killer. And sadly, there are so many more to come. Bill has 13 known victims, but it is thought that his actual victim count is at least in the 20s. Just one month after killing Darla Ferguson, Bill Suff found his fourth victim, and that was 35-year-old Carol Miller. Carol Miller was a sex worker that usually worked the University Avenue area in the city of Riverside, California. And like Lake Elsinore, Riverside had a red light district where Bill could very easily pick up sex workers. So Riverside became another hunting ground for Bill. And just keep in mind that at this point by day, Bill is considered to be a nice, helpful stand-up guy in the community. He even took people in who had nowhere to live. At one point, there are a couple people living with Bill in his apartment. No clue that Bill is spending his nights stalking the red light districts and murdering a mutual mutilating women. They had no clue that they were actually living with a serial killer. So like I was saying, Bill's fourth victim was a woman named Carol Miller and Bill picked her up on University Avenue, which is part of the red light district in Riverside. He drove her to a secluded area in his van where he raped her and then he smothered her. She also had four stab wounds to her chest, one of which went into her heart. After Carol was dead, Bill dumped her body in a citrus grove. And after he dumped her body, he stood there admiring his work while he ate a grapefruit. And we know that he did this because he actually left the grapefruit there at the spot where he had left the body. And this is just more proof that he had no idea about DNA. Two days later, some workers discovered Carol's body in the citrus grove. She was nude except for a shirt that was pulled over her head. Now, like I said, Bill is just leading this double life. By day, he's a great neighbor, a protector, etc., etc. And by night, he's an absolute monster. And this is where he becomes the face of that ride sharing campaign that I talked about earlier. There was a local campaign to start a ride sharing program where people in the local area would carpool together as a way to help the environment. And Bill Suff himself actually became the face of this whole ride sharing operation. And there were even ads made with Bill standing in front of his van, you know, the van that he's been using to pick up and murder sex workers in. And Bill is standing in front of his van with a big smile on his face. And the wording on the ad says, take a ride with Bill. And that part really creeped me out because we know what he's been doing in that van. So right around the time that Bill had killed his fourth victim in February of 1990, he met an 18 year old girl named Cheryl Lewis. Cheryl was still in high school. She attended Lake Elsinore High, but she had a job working at a Circle K gas station from 2 p.m. to 10 p.m. And she met Bill Suff while she was working there. He would come into the Circle K a lot because he had actually been asked to watch over that store by the owner. 
owner. He'd been asked to just frequently come by to check things out, make sure everything was on the up and up. And that's how trusted this man was by the community. He was being asked to keep an eye on businesses to make sure nothing criminal was going on. So Bill meets Cheryl at the Circle K and they very quickly strike up a relationship. And within one month, Cheryl moved in with Bill. And at this point, he's 40 years old and Cheryl is like 18. She's still in high school. And it is thought that this was deliberate, this huge age gap. The younger the woman is, the easier she would be to control. That was probably his thought process. He could shape her into whatever he wanted her to be. He could get away with whatever because she would be less likely to ask questions. And that's exactly what happened. And Bill and Cheryl got married in Vegas in March of 1990. And he immediately began controlling her. It was literally the same exact thing that he did to Terrell. He was abusive to her. He isolated her from her friends and her family. He wanted to make sure that she was in a very vulnerable position. And then Cheryl got pregnant, which we know is not a good situation. Bill does not do well with children. He can't control them like he does the women in his life. And he lashes out with violence. And I do think I mentioned this, but the people in his life at this point do not know about the murder of his daughter, Dee Dee, back in the 70s. So his new wife, Cheryl, had no clue that he'd killed his child. And just seven months after he and Cheryl got married, Bill was back out driving around the red light district looking for more victims. He was still working at the Riverside County Supply Warehouse at this point, and he would tell Cheryl that he had to work late once a month. He would also tell her that he worked for like a disaster relief group, I believe for like earthquakes. And it was just another excuse he came up with to explain why he was gone at random times. And Cheryl really didn't ask any questions. She was probably too scared to ask any questions. And on October 30th, a 35 year old woman named Cheryl Coker was found inside of a dumpster in Riverside. She had been strangled to death with a lot of force. And after she was dead, her right breast was cut off. And her breast was later found in the road about 30 feet from the body. Bill had sliced off Cheryl's breast and then just thrown it up onto an embankment. Her body was discovered in the dumpster on November 6th by some workers. And I debated mentioning this next part because it's never been confirmed, at least not from what I could tell, but Bill participated in a local chili cook-off and he actually won. And it's been rumored that he used some of the breast meat from some of the victims in this chili. I have no idea if that's true or not. Like I said, as far as I can tell, it's just a rumor, but you never know. And I think Bill Suff was sick and sadistic enough to do something like that. Then on December 21st, 1990, the body of a 27 year old woman named Susan Sternfeld was found near another dumpster in Riverside. She had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death. And not even one month after Susan Sternfeld's body was found, Bill was already looking for another victim. And on January 18th, 1991, Bill picked up a 42 year old woman named Kathy Puckett. Kathy had struggled with a heroin addiction for most of her life and she would work University Avenue to earn money to feed her addiction and just to survive. Kathy had last been seen by her sister who lived with her in Riverside. She told her sister that she was going to visit a friend to ask for a ride to her kids' soccer games the next morning, but she just vanished after that. Kathy's body was found next to a pile of trash in Lake Elsinore and she was nude and none of her personal items or articles of clothing were found at the scene. Bill had picked her up, drove her to a secluded spot, shoved a sock into her mouth to block her airway and then strangled her to death after sexually assaulting her. And then he just discarded her like trash. Now, while this crime scene was being processed, the investigators noticed several sets of tire tracks, but one set really stood out to them. They recognized this set as ones that they had found at the Carol Miller crime scene. And this is where they start connecting the dots and realizing that they are dealing with a serial killer who is targeting sex workers. In addition to the tire tracks, they also managed to link fibers from several of the recent murders to one another. And this confirmed that all of this was being done by the same person. After this discovery, the Lake Elsinore and the Riverside Police Department came together and they formed like a task force so that the officers from both cities could work together to solve the case. Flyers were made and a reward of $11,000 was offered to anyone who could give evidence that led to an arrest. But in the meantime, Bill Suff was just going to continue doing what he had been doing. His next victim was 24 year old Sherry Pacer. Sherry was born deaf, but she could read lips really well. And she was currently living with her grandmother in Riverside, about a mile away from the local bowling alley. And on April 26, 1991, Sherry told her grandmother that she was going to leave to go buy her sister a birthday present and she would be back soon. But 
Sherry never came back. Bill had picked Sherry up that night, assaulted her, and then strangled her to death. Then he dumped her body behind the bowling alley near her home. Around midnight, some people who were at the bowling alley decided to go outside to get some air, and they saw what they thought was a mannequin, but as they got closer, they realized that it was actually a dead body. The police were immediately called, and they arrived within a couple of minutes, and as the forensic team was processing the body, the sprinkler system suddenly turned on and started spraying the investigators and Sherry's body. The police had to form like a human shield in order to keep the body from getting sprayed, but this definitely compromised the evidence at the scene. However, they did still manage to find semen on her body. Then on July 4th, Bill's ninth known victim was found. A man was walking down Grape Street in Lake Elsinore when he discovered the nude body of a woman in some bushes. And the police actually recognized this victim. She was a well-known sex worker in the Lake Elsinore Red Light District, 37-year-old Sherry Latham. Sherry had been strangled to death and she also had a stab wound to her abdomen and her body was in an advanced state of decomposition because of the heat in California at the time. And then just three weeks after he'd raped and murdered his ninth victim, Bill Suff became a dad again. His wife Cheryl gave birth to a daughter that they named Bridget. Now at this point, the investigators were making some progress. They had linked these same tire tracks to several of the crime scenes and they managed to figure out the brand and type of tires on the vehicle. And they realized that there were three different brands of tires used on this one vehicle. And they thought that this was pretty unique. You know, there aren't many cars out there with three different brands of tires. So this was a pretty nice break in the case. And what Bill did next would provide the police with even more valuable information because Bill's next victim managed to escape. And she had a very thorough description of not only Bill, but also his vehicle. Around 10 p.m. on August 15th, 1991, a woman named Kelly Whitecloud and her friend Kelly Hammond were working the streets of University Avenue. The two women were really good friends. They had met when they were both incarcerated together back in 1986. And both Kelly Whitecloud and Kelly Hammond were struggling with serious drug addictions and they would do sex work in order to get drugs. And at the time they were both living in hotel rooms near University Avenue in Riverside. So on the night of August 15th, they were working University Avenue when a silver van pulled up to the curb near Kelly Whitecloud. And of course the driver was Bill Suff. Kelly asked Bill if he was looking for a date and he said yes. So the two of them briefly discussed details like payment, services, etc. They settled on $20 for a standard basic sex session. But Kelly also told Bill that she was pregnant and she was hungry and she wanted him to throw in a trip to McDonald's as well. Bill agreed and so Kelly got into the van and they drove to McDonald's. They went inside and they ordered food and they went back out to the van and Bill was like, okay, you have your food. Now let's go ahead and head to the orchards to have sex. Well, this immediately struck Kelly as odd because she had a hotel room and he knew that. So she was like, why are we going to the orchards? I have a hotel room where we can go. And when Kelly said this, Bill's whole demeanor changed. He then told Kelly that they were going to the orchards to have sex and the money for the food was coming out of the $20 that he had promised her. So Kelly gets pissed and also she's really suspicious about the orchard situation. So she's like, you know what? I'm not doing this anymore. I went out of the van right now. But Bill would not stop the van and he starts pulling out of the McDonald's driveway. So Kelly just opens up the van door and she jumps out while he's driving and she falls directly on her stomach. And Bill didn't skip a beat. He just kept driving until he came upon Kelly Hammond, who was standing on the sidewalk just half a block away. And he asks her to get into the van. Now, Kelly Whitecloud is seeing this happen and she's panicking because she knows that this guy is up to no good. The women who worked this area knew all about the recent murders. And now Kelly Whitecloud was very suspicious of this man in the van. So she starts screaming as loud as she possibly can to Kelly Kelly Hammond not to get in the van. She's screaming, don't get in. It's not worth it. Do not go with him. But Kelly Hammond just yells back, you know, it's okay. I'll be back. But she would not come back. She became Bill's 10th victim that night. And this just kind of shows you how unhinged Bill is becoming and how confident he is. He knew that Kelly Whitecloud was now a witness to this. He knew she saw Kelly Hammond get into the van, but he still murdered her anyway. Kelly Hammond's nude body was discovered early the next morning in an alleyway near a trucking company. She had been raped and strangled and her body had been deliberately posed with her legs open. And Kelly's body was actually still warm when it was discovered. So they had just 
miss the killer. Detective Christine Kears Sheffield was heading up the investigation in Riverside and she recognized Kelly Hammond. She had kind of formed a relationship with some of the women that worked the streets. She kind of looked out for them and she knew that this was Kelly Hammond. And she also knew that Kelly Hammond was really good friends with Kelly Whitecloud. So she decided to go talk to Kelly Whitecloud to see if she knew anything. Maybe she had seen who Kelly left with that night. And so Kelly Whitecloud tells Detective Keir Sheffield everything. She worked with an artist to come up with a sketch of the suspect. She also describes the van in great detail and the detectives take her around to several different car dealerships in the area to try to pinpoint the make and model of the van, but they did not take her to a Mitsubishi dealer. So Kelly Whitecloud said that the Astro van was probably the closest thing to the van that this man was driving. And she also said that there was gray carpet inside of the van. So Kelly Whitecloud really gave them a lot of new, really helpful information to work with. So after this, the task force gets together to discuss all of this new information and Detective Keir Sheffield happens to mention that it seems like the killer is not targeting black sex workers. Out of 10 known victims, none of them were black. Now this was just mentioned in passing by the detective, but the next day the lead investigator sent out a press release with that written in it, that the killer does not target black sex workers. So of course, victim number 11 was a black sex worker. Bill saw this information and he did not like the fact that police thought that they knew his victim type and he wanted to show them that he could target anyone he wanted to. There was no victim type. So victim number 11 was a 30 year old woman named Catherine McDonald. She was Bill's only known black victim and she was four months pregnant at the time. And Bill mutilated her body. It was as if he was enraged that the police thought that he had a victim type. And so he went overboard to show them how wrong they were. Catherine was working University Avenue on the night that she disappeared, September 13th, 1991. Bill picked her up and she was never seen alive again. Her body was found near a hilltop in Lake Elsinore the day after she disappeared. She was nude. Her body was also posed. Her feet were together, but her legs were spread apart. She had been strangled and stabbed in the chest and her right breast had been cut off and she had also been stabbed in her genitals. Shoe prints and tire tracks were found at the scene and they were all consistent with the ones that they'd found at some of the other dumping sites. So there was no doubt that this was the same person. So as Catherine McDonald's body is being discovered, a couple of investigators who were new to the task force were actually at the Riverside Supply House, the same place that Bill Suff worked. And they were actually speaking to Bill at the very moment that their pagers went off to notify them that there had been another murder. So the investigators asked Bill if they can use the phone in the warehouse and he says yes. So they called the station and they started taking notes about this latest murder. And Bill was listening in on this entire conversation and he knows exactly what this call is about. And when they got off the phone, Bill was like, oh, what was that about? Was there another murder last night? And Bill must have absolutely loved that. The fact that he was directly involved in this investigation and the police had no idea. It had to make him feel like he was in total control. Then in October of 1991, history nearly repeats itself when Bill's three month old daughter, Bridget, is rushed to the hospital. Cheryl and Bill had taken Bridget to the ER saying that she wasn't acting normal. She just seemed off, but there there were no visible wounds on her body. So the doctors initially think that she has a bad ear infection or something like that, something typical. So the doctors initially just prescribed her some ear drops, but that didn't help. So Cheryl brings her back in and they start examining her and doing more tests. And that's when they realize that this baby has been badly injured and she has serious brain damage and several broken ribs. It was determined that she had shaken baby syndrome. Bill had done it again, but it seems like this time, instead of beating her and causing her bruising like visible damage, he violently shook her and caused extensive internal injuries. And the doctors actually thought that Bridget wasn't going to make it. Her prognosis was not good. But in the end, she does live, but the damage was done. She had life changing injuries. So the police immediately suspect Bill Suff and he's taken in for questioning and he denies doing anything to Bridget and he agrees to take a polygraph test to prove his innocence. And the results of this polygraph test were inconclusive and police couldn't find any conclusive evidence that Bill had been abusive towards Bridget, so they dropped the charges. Cheryl did separate from Bill for a little while, but in the end, he managed to sweet talk her into coming back. He promised that he would be a better husband and a better father, and then he would make all these changes, and so Cheryl actually took him back. They ended up moving into an apartment in the city of Colton, and they were just trying to work things out. And
And as an early Christmas present, Cheryl gave Bill a pair of Converse shoes. And these shoes would be a vital piece of evidence in this case. And everything was about to come crumbling down for Bill and his reign of terror would finally come to an end. So on October 30th, 1991, just days after being questioned about the injuries to his daughter, Bill killed his 12th victim. 35 year old Delia Zamora was found near a freeway. She had been strangled and sexually assaulted. Then on December 23rd, Bill picked up a 39 year old sex worker named Eleanor Casares and Eleanor would be his final victim. He took her to a citrus grove, assaulted her, then strangled strangled her to death and then he mutilated her body. And he had picked up Eleanor during the day where anyone could have spotted his van. Anyone could have easily seen her leave with him, but he took his chances anyway. Just a couple of hours after Bill was there in the citrus grove killing Eleanor, a man arrived to set up the irrigation system in the citrus grove and he was driving through and he spotted a person who he thought was asleep in the grove. So he slowed down as he passed to get a better look and he realized that this person wasn't sleeping, she was dead. In addition to being strangled, Eleanor had been stabbed in her chest and her right breast had been cut off and thrown into a row of trees in the grove. And Detective Keir Sheffield immediately recognized Eleanor. She had become acquainted with Eleanor during her work on the task force. And you know, she would talk frequently to the girls that worked the red light district and she really liked Eleanor. And Detective Keir Sheffield had just spoken to Eleanor about being extra careful because there was a madman out there hunting and killing sex workers. The same tire tracks were found at that scene and now a pair of Converse shoes had made prints near the body. And remember that Cheryl had just bought Bill a brand new pair of Converse as an early Christmas present. The Riverside Police Department decided to put together a plan to finally take the killer down once and for all. They called the plan Operation Apprehension. And the plan was that the red light district in Riverside would be broken up into sections and members of the police department would be assigned to a section. They all had a description of the vehicle and a description of the suspect and they were to continuously watch over their area. And if they saw any prostitution activity at all, they were to go question the sex worker and the customer. And on the night of January 9th, 1992, an officer watched as a grayish van made a U-turn in the parking lot of a liquor store on University Avenue. A woman approached the driver's side of the van, but she noticed the officer watching and she immediately turned around and walked away from the van. The officer started following this van as it left the liquor store because it did fit the description of the one involved in the murders. So he decided to pull the van over for making a right-hand turn without signaling. And as he approaches the driver, he immediately realizes that this guy really does fit the description of the suspect. His driver's license was expired and so was his vehicle registration. And he had also written like handwritten different addresses on his license. Like he had crossed out the original one and just wrote in new addresses all over it. And the officer noticed that a lot of these addresses were near the Lake Elsinore area. And this was another red flag for him because of course there were so many murders in Lake Elsinore as well. The officer decides to impound the van and he contacts Detective Keir Sheffield and the first question she asks is what type of tires are on the van? And sure enough there are three different brands of tires on this van. The front driver's side was a Yokohama, the two passenger side tires were a Uniroyal, and the back left was a Dunlap. And this matched up perfectly to the ones that they had identified at the other crime scenes. So they knew that they finally had their killer. Inside the van, they also found gray interior, just like Kelly Whitecloud had described. There was also a knife found in the van that still had dried blood from one of the victims on it. There was a BB gun under the passenger side seat, and there were also fibers that matched some that were recovered on the bodies. Then the search of Bill's apartment turned up even more incriminating evidence. First of all, a pair of shoes were found that matched the shoe prints to the other murders before Cheryl had bought him the Converse. Same size, same brand, everything. Also, they found very various items belonging to some of the victims. Bill had just been giving some of these items to girlfriends, to his wife. He had been just keeping some as trophies. And when they took Bill Suff into the station to be questioned, the first thing that Detective Keir Sheffield noticed was that he was wearing Converse shoes, just like the ones that they had identified as leaving the shoe prints at the most recent crime scenes. So she starts questioning Bill about why his tire tracks were found at the Citrus Grove where Eleanor Casares was found. And he was like, oh, Oh yeah, I was at the citrus grove, but I was just picking oranges that morning. And so she's like, you were out at an orange grove picking oranges on your way to work. That doesn't make sense. And he was like, well, yeah, that's what I was doing. And then totally unprompted, Bill says, oh, and by the way, I found a dead body out there. And she was like, you found a body and you didn't report it and you just went to work. Eventually,
Obviously, Bill knew that he wasn't going to be able to talk his way out of this. So he just completely shut down and he stopped talking and he never admitted to any of the murders. Blood, hair, and saliva samples were taken. And of course, Bill did come back as a match. There were some murders that have been linked to Bill Suff that date back to 1986, but there wasn't enough evidence to charge him in those cases. So there is a chance that his life as a serial murderer actually started a few years earlier than we thought. And on March 25th, 1995, the trial began and Bill Suff pled not guilty. 271 witnesses were called by the prosecution and over 1,000 pieces of evidence were submitted. So this was a very long case. The trial actually took seven months and Bill just continued to deny everything. He claimed that he was a nice, loving, caring person and you could ask anyone who knew him and they would tell you how great he is. In the end, Bill was found guilty of the attempted murder of Rhonda Jetmore and all of the other murders, except except for Sherry Pacer. Bill Seaman was found inside of Sherry Pacer, but there was also another man Seaman found there as well. And remember Sherry Pacer's body had been the one sprayed by the sprinklers. So it is thought that there was a lot of vital evidence that was lost and destroyed by that water. So the jury was kind of hung on her case specifically. So he was not found guilty of Sherry Pacer's murder. And Bill was sentenced to death on October 10th, 1995. He is still alive and he remains on death row in San Quentin prison. And that was the case of the Lake Elsinore killer. And I really hate that the only information that I could give you all about the victims is that they were sex workers and drug addicts, but that's all that was really out there. They were mothers, they were daughters, sisters, they had friends and they had just fallen on hard times and made some bad choices in life, but that should not diminish the tragedy of this case. As always, I wanna hear what you guys think about this one. So let me know down in the comments and don't forget that you can try Aura completely free by clicking my link in the description box and the first 500 people to use my link will get 25% off their first year subscription. If you find this type of content interesting, please consider subscribing and following me on Instagram at summer underscore Sanchez YT. And as always, I appreciate each and every one of you for watching and I will see you next time.